let's start with a prayer. Hanan Hor, Yevotvo, Yevokvin, Serpo, Amen. Imastutun, Hor Jesus, Durmez Imastutun, Esparis, Horel, Yev Hosel, Yev Korzel, Arachiko, Hamenanjam. Ichar Horotoz, Ipanit, Evi Korzos, Pergiamez, Yevormia, Koar Razoz, Yemez, Paz Mamerazes. Parkor, Yevotvo, Yevokvin, Serpo, Ajum, Yev Mish, Tevavidian, Savidenitz, Amen. We continue today going through uh, the Gospel of Matthew uh, as fast as we can, trying to summarize everything in five weeks. And uh, today we uh, enter the third section of the Gospel, which is the third discourse of our Lord and the materials that Matthew has woven around the third discourse. Very quickly, initially we said, uh, many scholars believe the Gospel of Matthew was written um, uh, in parallel, in likeness to the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, and thus that's five parts. The five parts of the Gospel of Matthew are the five major discourses, sermons by our Lord, and then, of course, enhancing materials, supporting material in between these discourses. The Gospel starts with the birth of Jesus. We said very importantly, he, find, he emphasizes the heavenly birth, uh, and also the, the worldly uh, birth. He first traces Jesus' birth all the way back to uh, David and Abraham to prove that he is from the lineage of the promised Messiah. And then biologically, he traces it, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, then spiritually, he traces his birth to the Holy Spirit, uh, making him the anointed one who came from God to preach the gospel. Of course, the angel say, says, as then will be Yeshua, Jesus, because he will uh, uh, save Immediately after that, Jesus starts preparing for the ministry. He goes out, he fasts for 40 days, which was the practice in the Old Testament in preparation for holy wars. The incarnation of Jesus is the beginning of the holy war against Satan, which will culminate in the destruction of Satan and sin and its sh the shackles. Uh, so he goes, he prepares himself, fasting for 40 days uh, and praying. And then he's tempted by Satan, after which he comes victorious, he comes down gathers his team, his apostles, uh, because he needs that team to go out and preach the gospel. And after this, uh, we uh, we uh, read about the, uh, before this, we read about the baptism, which was how, according to the Ma gospel of Matthew, Jesus proclaimed the beginning of his ministry. It's like a hallowed style staging of the beginning of the ministry or the war against Satan and destruction. Following this, we spoke about uh, two discourses. The first discourse was that of the Sermon on the Mount. And scholars likened this to uh, the Ten Commandments, the giving of the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, Moses went up to the mountain. In this case, Jesus went up to the mountain. In the Ten Commandments, the rules and the covenant of the Old Testament was established. In this in case, Jesus gives the rules or the commandments of the New Testament, thus establishing the New Covenant with the people uh, of God. Then we spoke about how uh, Matthew fills the space after this with stories of miracles. And that's what that was supposed to um, strengthen the reader's understanding of Jesus as the Messiah. Because one of the things about the Messiah is that he would perform uh, supernatural things and <laughs> heal people and the sick and all that. Then we moved... Uh, <clears throat> To the second discourse, it was about uh, commissioning the apostles, sending them out uh, with a mission. Interestingly enough, <coughs> after the story of Moses and after the uh, uh, people of covenant, excuse me, sir, I won't cough. After the people became the people of the old covenant, God sends out people to prepare the path of Joshua's entry into the promised land. Uh, various kinds of people, if you haven't read, it's interesting reading, uh, reading them, the book of Judges and how uh, Joshua and then the Israelites enter. People, uh, God sends forerunners, uh, spies, uh, generals, and of course prophets as well, to in a way establish this uh, land of the new covenant. Likewise, in the New Testament, the second thing Jesus does is he sends his apostles out 
on a commission. We emphasized last time that this commission is not the final commission because the gospel is not completed yet. They went out to preach uh, the message prepare for the kingdom of God is at hand because the actual gospel will be fulfilled when Jesus dies on the cross and is risen uh, and, of course, ascends to heaven. That will be the final commission which we read about in the gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 28. That ends the second discourse. Now today we start with the third discourse, uh, <clears throat> and it is a discourse of parables. But just like the first um, uh, discourse was followed by a set of miracles, which prepared us for uh, the second thing, which is Jesus, like God, sends his apostles out to establish, to preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. After the second uh, discourse, we also have a buffer zone of filling materials. In this case, it is to emphasize uh, Jesus is the Messiah, is the God, but not using miracles. In the first case, Matthew, if you remember, put all the miracles together, almost all the miracles together uh, in, a, in a sequence almost sounding artificial, one after the other, after the other, just miracles. The idea was like a proof text that this is the Messiah, the Son of God, because it was written the Messiah will perform miracles. In this case, as we are about to start the third uh, discourse, which is um, uh, a discourse about the parables and teaching in parables, again, uh, the evangelist Matthew starts uh, giving us some filling information to highlight that Jesus is the Messiah. One of the key things uh, he does is referring to uh, John the Baptist. We heard about John the Baptist uh, briefly, but not much. So it's time for uh, the evangelist Matthew to kind of capitalize on the function of John the Baptist uh, in preparing for the coming of Jesus. Let's go to, I think we arrived chapter, end of 10. Actually, it's interesting if you uh, read, let's see, chapter 10. Well, okay, here it is, 10. <clears throat> you see the chapter ends, trying to find and finish. If you go to chapter 11, verse 1, if you have your Bibles in front of you, please go chapter 11, verse 1. You'll see the verse reads, Now when Jesus had finished instructing the 12. At the beginning of chapter 10, we hear Jesus gathered the 12 and started commissioning them to go out and send them out for mission. And it is the whole chapter. At the end of chapter 10, we go to chapter 11, verse 1. We read, when Jesus had left, has finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to uh, teach and proclaim his message in their cities. Uh, we don't read about what happened with the apostles. They were sent with a mission, but we don't know uh, the apostle or the evangelist Matthew does not tell us what happened as a result of their mission for several reasons. Number one, this was not the final commission. He's going to send them out later on. This was a practice. Number two, the idea of sending them out was to emphasize Jesus' the, uh, authority, that he is like the God of the Old Testament. In fact, he is the God of the Old Testament, who in the Old Testament, send out the prophets and, and the uh, forerunners to prepare for uh, the people of the new covenant, of the old covenant. In this case, Jesus sends his apostles out to continue preaching, establishing the new covenant. And then, as soon as he says Jesus went down, 
we move to the story of uh, the evangelist, uh, to the uh, John the Baptist. We find him in prison. Um, if you read chapter 11, verses 2 and following, when John heard in prison, he says in prison because earlier in chapter 4, verse 22, he said, and Herod uh, and the authorities arrested John. He leaves it like that. We don't know what happened after that. So here he picks up the story, but obviously for a purpose. When uh, John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, are you the one who is to come? Which is really the theme in a way of this uh, of this chapter. Yes, he is the one to come. Yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, he is the son of God. But the question for me for, for many, many, many years really was, there's a contradiction because John the Baptist is the one who baptized Jesus. And he was the one who said, Lord, I am not worthy that uh, you become you, you be baptized by me. In fact, if anything, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, now let's think aside, let's fulfill the will of the God and let me be baptized. So what happened that um, 10 chapters later, John the Baptist does not recognize Jesus. Well, that's why he puts the phrase, when he was in prison. So what happened is John baptized Jesus, and when he was very bold in preaching the coming of the reign of God contra the temple, because uh, the temple authorities were very relaxed and, and teaching uh, their traditions and customs. Uh, John the Baptist and the Essenes uh, went out of the temple uh, as a statement of revolt and, 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 and rejection of the temple, which uh, upset many, many of the temple authorities. And they went out to the desert and they preached there. If uh, you've ever been to Jerusalem on pilgrimage, if not, you can join me this January. We go out to, we see this deserted area, the deserts where John the Baptist actually was baptized or was baptizing. Uh, and was teaching. Uh, and you see there nowhere close a temple or a chapel. So it was a very, very strong statement that we reject the hypocrisy of the temple. So because he was arrested for the boldness of his preaching, John has been in a cell. And all he knows is he's hearing about things. All of a sudden he hears about this man, Jesus, uh, born in Bethlehem, uh, is preaching uh, he doesn't know whether it's the actual Jesus is Baptist or not. That's why he sent his apostles. Are you the one? Uh, and of course, Jesus said, yes, uh, I am the one. In this case, our, uh, our the evangelist Matthew uses this uh, reference to John the Baptist that he was prisoned and he was worried that this is the Messiah or not. So he sent his disciples to check with Jesus. And Jesus picks up the argument from here and he starts comparison between him and John the Baptist and the old prophets. The key element here is that John is the end of the Old Testament prophets and that John is the climax uh, of these prophets as far as the message he preached because the other prophets uh, preached about forthcoming events in the life of Israel, including, let's say, the destruction of the temple, the return of the people of God, the remnant, and things like that. But John the Baptist was preaching the, the preparation for the new covenant. He was functioning, or he functioned as uh, a voice in the wilderness, crying for the uh, preparation of the way to the Son of God, to the Messiah, as the prophet said. That's why he says, there is no greater man born of a woman that uh, uh, is uh, uh, greater than John the Baptist because his function as a prophet uh, was the most important one. He prepared the path for the coming of the kingdom of God. Remember when we say the kingdom, we talk about the reign of God, the rule of God. It's not a spatial thing. Rather, it's a, a, a eternal rule of God that everybody will feel that they will be subject to it. 
And because of relationship, this relationship between the other prophets, our Lord mentions Elijah. Elijah is a prophet of prophets. He's a prophet par excellence. He was such a, a good prophet that God took him up to heaven without allowing him to die. In our uh, hockey on Keith, every Sunday we sing, where Elijah stays um, uh, old, getting older, because he did not die. So there was an understanding in Judaism before Jesus, in the time of Jesus, that when the Messiah comes, before him, Elijah will return, and Elijah would preach uh, the path of the kingdom of God and, and the coming of the Messiah. And here uh, in this paragraph, uh, Jesus likens John the Baptist to Elijah. In fact, he says he was the Elijah. If you read chapter 14, Jesus says, if you will, John the Baptist is Elijah. By doing so, uh, he does five, six important things. Number one, he fulfill, he confirms that the prophecy has been fulfilled, that there was a forerunner before the Messiah, which number two makes him the Messiah, the anointed one of God. <clears throat> Uh, and here he refers to uh, a saying by Isaiah, uh, verse 15. You've heard it a lot, but many people don't know its context. Let me read it for you so I can clarify it. And if you are willing to accept, he is Elijah, John the Baptist, who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. Remember this? Our Lord says it often. That anyone who has ears uh, listen, because we can hear with our ears, but not necessarily listen. Uh, I've spoken with people; they were like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I know their mind is not with me. If I quiz them on what I said, they wouldn't know. Sometimes the opposite happens. Why people talk to me and my mind is busy. I'm going to go here. There's this meeting. There's this and that. And I said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I realized I haven't been listening to this person for the past minute or so. And I make a point to correct myself and stop, leave everything aside and, and pay some attention. So we can hear, but not necessarily listen. And this is very important for many, many reasons. Historically, Isaiah the prophet chastises people for having ears but not listening. So you hear, oh, 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 but you don't listen, you don't make a mental note. And by the way, we'll see, in order to understand parables, you need to listen. Because you can hear the parable, a farmer went and planted seeds, and, but you need to absorb that and then go deeper. You have to allow your brain to process that thought, to understand what the meaning, the deeper meaning of the parable is. But that's coming later. This is commercial. For now, Jesus is saying, from the day of Isaiah, you, O people of God of the Old Testament, have ignored the message of the revelation, have heard whatever you wanted to hear, and translated that into do whatever you wanted to be translated to, but you have not listened. And thus here, Jesus says Elijah was uh, present uh, in John the Baptist who prepared the path for the Messiah who am I? Jesus Christ. And that's why he says but whoever has ears let him listen. In other words, go and read the Old Testament prophecies of performed miracles, open the eyes of the sick, and all these things, and that's what the Messiah was supposed to be doing. I was born of a virgin, which was a miraculous birth of the Holy Spirit, which makes me from God, which makes me the anointed. On baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon me, which makes me the anointed one of God, and all and all these points. Further uh, pressing this point, obviously you see it's chapter 12 now, 11, Jesus is preparing to start aggravating his enemies to prepare for the crucifixion. He gives them a very, very ironic example, uh, verses 16 to 17. Um, he says, you are like children on the streets. Now, in those days, there were no youth centers or hours after school for talent courses, whatever. 
street, children were on the streets. So he says, the children were complaining. Whenever we played for you to dance, you didn't dance. And whenever we mourned, you didn't cry with us. In other words, you just chose to do whatever you want to do. You did not want to understand the situation and uh, follow the situation. You did whatever you want to do. Now, the reason he gives this example, again, he has in mind uh, John the Baptist, Jesus, and the story of Elijah. Let's not forget Isaiah, who kept telling these people, you have ears, but you don't listen. And by the way, just for example, uh, Isaiah's conclusion was, thus you will be destroyed. The Babylonians are coming to destroy Israel, and it so happened. The Babylonians came and, and destroyed the city and took the kings and the uh, important VIPs of Israel as slaves to Babylon. But in this case, having said this example of you neither danced with us when we were playing nor cried with us when we were uh, sad, Jesus said, you are hypocrites. Because when John the Baptist came and he was very, very strict, he went to the desert. His clothing was very, very basic. He ate very, very simple food. He did not socialize. He said, oh, he is introvert. He's not normal. You know, it's too much. This is the real world. He has to be. So he says, you rejected him. And then when the son of man comes and he eats, he eats with the rich people and, and mingles with the people and travels here and there, so, oh, what kind of religious man is this? You know, he's partying and it reminds me about <laughs> Armenians and their beautiful relationship with their clergy. Now, if the clergy is always in a cassock, you have Lulj or Luis. They say he has no pastoral leader. My children are afraid of him. You know, he, he doesn't know how to talk to them. But if you remove your cassock, start playing the piano or smoke a cigar. He smokes a cigar, he, he drinks beer, he, you know. So the point is, and this is very important, believe me. The point is, although they have ears, but they're not listening to the message of whether the introvert they're hire or the dare who gets drunk. That's not the point. The point is you have to listen to the message. These people will come and go. Some of them will be very happy, always dancing. Some of them will be very sad uh, in their rooms, just reading. The point is, are you making an effort to listen to the message or not? And that's something, by the way, you cannot cheat God or, or the angels. It's your salvation because the message lies in listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This part of, remember, this is a filler because now come, will come the third uh, discourse. So they have this stories about John the Baptist and then the children playing, we're rejecting them. And then Jesus has a prayer, verses 25 to 27. In this prayer, he basically says it as is. I and the Father are one. He who sees me sees the Father. Nobody can see the Father without seeing me. So in, in any possible philosophical uh, formula, he's saying, I am God. I am the anointed one of God. Uh, I am the, 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 the Messiah. The ending of this chapter is a nice conclusion by Jesus where he again compares the old with the new, uh, Jesus with Moses. Here he says, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. And then he says, my yoke is light. Why does he say that? Because the Old Testament law was refer referred to by the rabbis as a yoke on our shoulders. You have to pray 10 times a day. You have to wash your hands 20 times. You have to kneel. You have to bow. You have to uh, uh, slaughter animals. You have to observe this uh, Pesach rule. This is, it, it, you had lawyers for it. They called themselves Pharisees. It was so complicated. It was so difficult that the rabbis themselves called it a yoke a weight to carry over your shoulders. That is why Jesus here, when he says, but my yoke is light. 
In other words, he's comparing this gospel uh, versus the Old Testament man-made laws or traditions of the law. And he's saying, follow me, forget the old, because the new is much lighter, is much easier, and I will give you rest, I will give you peace. So the filler here, chapter 11, serves emphasizing that Jesus is God, Jesus and God are one, and Jesus was before Elijah and before Isaiah, using uh, prophets such as um, John the Baptist, which is the final of the uh, Old Testament prophets, and then, of course, uh, Elijah, Isaiah. Uh, Jesus, uh, the, Matthew makes this point uh, that reaches culmination with the prayer at the end of the chapter where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Chapter 12 is another filler. We still are not um, in the main discourse. Do you see, when you read chapter 11, if you read it, if you haven't read it, you'll see there's no one long sermon. There are dialogues. Jesus moves from place to place. So these are not discourses. They're not long sermons. There are small vignettes, uh, you know, story here, story there, and event here, event there. John the Baptist was important to be brought in parallel with Jesus because they rejected John and Jesus as well. So um, it was the right time for Matthew to bring this story, of course, also to let us know that he was uh, arrested for being blunt in preaching the gospel. Jesus says, they said, uh, they rejected me, and they will reject you as well. Chapter 5, Gospel of Matthew. So preaching the truth can cost you many things in this fallen world. So, in this case, for John the Baptist, caused him his life. He was beheaded at the end. Chapter 12, Jesus starts now exposing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, you know, the scribes, but in a way to highlight the superiority of the new gospel over the old man-made traditions of the law. So, um, the chapter starts, verses 1 to 8. His apostles are walking through uh, uh, fields of grain, and they're hungry, so they start eating heads of the grain. And immediately, oh, and, and we are told it was Sabbath. Okay, So these are key things uh, that you need to highlight in your mind. When I teach the preaching course, you know, the audience need to know, why is he saying it was a Sabbath? This must serve. Do I care if it was Wednesday or Thursday or Friday? Why is he giving me the day? Once he says Sabbath, there must be a message there. And the message is that on Sabbath, you don't work in the field. You don't cut the heads of the grains, even if you were hungry and starving, because that's work, uh, labor you're doing. So the disciples of Jesus are hungry, and, and they go, and um, they plug the heads and they eat it. And of course, uh, the Pharisees and the scraps come and says, is it lawful? Is it lawful? So the question now is, they're clear, but is subjecting Jesus to the law? In other words, with the false assumption that you are not fulfilling the requirements of the law because you are subject to the law. So that paper would get F from me because I say the, your assumption is wrong. I am the author of the law I'm talking to. I am not subject to the law. Your law was given to you in a time when people were uh, uh, beginning to believe, infants in faith, and they needed basic regulations to organize them. But now that God is with you, you don't need laws. Now there's a gospel of love and forgiveness. Now there's a gospel of God dying as the ransom of our uh, sins to free us from the shackles of sin and death. That's why when this argument starts, Jesus, uh, if you uh, think is, I don't have time to read all these paragraphs, but it's, it's a very interesting dialogue. If you can read the chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. But in verses 6, which is right in the middle, it's like the climax. Uh, you know what Jesus tells them as they are accusing him? He says, someone greater than the temple is here. Now, it was the Pharisee, the scribes, and he who is ignoring the law. And he tells them, you know what? I'm tired of you. 
someone who is greater than the temple is here. I am greater than the temple. <clears throat> um, what is the point? The point is for the Israelites, the temple is where God resides. In the Holy of Holies was a throne which they believed actually uh, God uh, was present. When you say greater than the temple, you know, uh, you're, you're greater than God's presence on this earth. So uh, it's very provocative. And of course, they uh, argue with him. Uh, they do not believe in him. Uh, and his, uh, quite, uh, his answer to them is, man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, these rules that were revealed to you were to organize uh, the life of man. So you live comfortably and happily. You don't go and kill everybody you don't like. You don't steal money from people because they're richer than you. You don't violate every man and woman you come across the street. Uh, but this is not the ultimate revelation of God. Up upon this, you build a relationship with God that is supposed to escort you to the new covenant, which is the covenant of knowing God. The objective of these laws were to regulate man. So really the focus is man and not the laws. The laws were made so that man can live uh, happily ever after and um, and enjoy the life. That's why Jesus says, you don't get it again. And he refers to the prophecy of Hosea, chapter 6, where the prophet says, and God told me, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Because that sacrifice that people made to God was supposed to be expression of their faith, of their love to God. In return, God would reward them by forgiving their sins. But when you reduce that to a mechanical act of just slaughtering animals, and if you're a rich man, you send your slave to buy the things and take it to the priest with instructions and where to put your name so everybody knows that you did this. Um, the point was then you lost the point because the sacrifice was to be an expression of your love and of your faith uh, in God. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. God is not hungry for blood and destroyed and uh, killed animals. That was supposed to be to express our love. Um, nice ring on the day of engagement tells the beautiful girl how much that ma man loves her, that he sacrificed his precious uh, money to buy that ring for her. So, you know, uh, she can understand how much he, he, he loves her. The same story, by the way, is repeated almost three, four times. So, uh, verses 9 to uh, 14, is the healing of a man with withered hand. In this case, again, it's a Sabbath. And again, uh, now this time they learn. This time they did not tell them it's not lawful for us. Now this time they're a bit kinder. Uh, so he heals this man's hand or arm, which was withered. And then they say, um, is it lawful to do this on a Sabbath? Is it lawful? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's a rhetoric question, which leads to the same conclusion. In other words, shame on you. It's not lawful to do this. It's a Sabbath. And again, Jesus argues that man is more important than the law because a man who is suffering of not being able to live his life fully because of an illness, he deserves healing no matter what the day or the hour of the day uh, is. The same story repeats in uh, verses 15 to 21. And he says, uh, and he healed many of them. In fact, he says, crowds for healed all of them. Uh, again, of course, the point is to emphasize that as the Messiah, he's doing what he's supposed to do, which is to heal people, which was uh, promised by the prophets that he will do. But in telling us these things, he is throwing in beautiful jewels that uh, enlighten our faith. At the end, he says, he ordered them not to make him known. <laughs> we spoke about this uh, several times in the past, I think. Um, it's called the Messianic Secret. Jesus knew that he hasn't yet completed the witnessing and the teaching of all the terms of the gospel. 
once that's done, he knows his next stage will, stage will be to go to Jerusalem to be crucified and pay the price of the sins of all humanity. But he's not there yet. It's the last thing to preach. So whenever he, did, he performed a miracle, he was careful that the word doesn't go out because the Pharisees will use that against him, just like what used now. Um, uh, and that will hinder him preaching in that village or that town. He'll have to leave, which happens in one case said he left uh, the town because they start harassing him and saying, this man is demonic. He's doing uh, demonic things. That's why he says, uh, please don't tell or don't uh, announce it. But Matthew, being the one writing to the Jews, who knew the Old Testament very well, supposedly, even this, he sees in it a fulfillment of the prophecy. Because in Isaiah 42, which talks about the servant of God, who will suffer on this earth, he says, but he will make, he will not make noise. He will not let things known about him. He'll be very quiet and he'll do his work without uh, proclaiming or, or, I mean, making noise or, or complaining. So Matthew sees in Jesus saying his apostles, don't tell anybody as uh, also a fulfillment of that prophecy. Remember, the main theme of Mark, Matthew is that Jesus from the Jews crucified was the anointed one of God, was the Messiah who had come to save his people. The chapter continues with um, verses 22 to 37, another healing. But in this case, <clears throat> there's an escalation because uh, the people healed call him the son of David. Remember, we spoke about the meaning of son in the first lesson we had. And we said it doesn't necessarily mean the biological son and doesn't necessarily mean the immediate son of a man. It can mean the great son, the great great son, the great 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 son, as long as somehow that ultimate man is the father, grandfather, great great grandfather. So Jesus is the son of David in that sense. But why is this phrase important? Because from David's lineage will come the Messiah, the uh, anointed one of God. So once you say, uh, Vahan, son of David, and you know my father's name is not David, it's Avedis, then there's a problem because you're telling the whole world and me that you think I am of the lineage, lineage of David, thus the Messiah. Now, in this case, the Messiah has come, so I don't worry. But in those cases where they're expecting the Messiah, it's a very provocative uh, statement for the Jews. That's why the Pharisees escalate their uh, attack again. They say this man is from Baal Zebul. Interesting word. Uh, Baal means the Lord, the master, the Lord. Uh, and usually it was a term used for God in the cultures neighboring Israel. And the Israelites borrowed this word from the Baal. There's Baal Bek. But uh, Zebul is interesting. According to some linguists, Zebul is uh, the modification of Zebub, which means fly, Zubab, fly. So Be'el Zebub means the god of fly. It's a, it's a derogatory way of saying god of nothing, it's just no powers. So the, Jew, Jews, uh, the Jews uh, called Satan Be'el Zebul. He has no powers, he's nothing compared to our god. He's the god of flies. So here, the Pharisees, accusing Jesus of being demonic, they said he is from Beelzebul. So they escalated the argument, preparing uh, to uh, excite the clouds to push to the crucifixion. Now, obviously, Jesus knows this is coming, and obviously Jesus will ultimately have to avoid this. But for now, Jesus refutes the argument. And he talks about, if you read verse 25, Every kingdom divided on itself, uh, laid waste, cannot survive. The point is, if I am from Satan, from Beelzebub, and if I'm preaching the gospel of the enemy of Beelzebub, who is God, then we are divided. Uh, you know, America doesn't send its armies to foreign lands to do propaganda against America. They go out to protect our interests and our country. Once you go out and you start promoting the interests of other enemies, 
then we're in trouble. Then we are a divided nation. And that divided nation, Jesus says, cannot survive. So how can you accuse me of being from Satan when I am attacking Ch Satan and I'm uh, chasing Ch Satan and I am fighting Satan by preaching the truth and the word of God? And here comes one of the difficult sayings of the gospel uh, whereby Jesus turns to his apostles and says, by the way, of course, the Pharisees are wrong and all that. But then he says, verse 28, it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons. In other words, not only logically he tells them, I am not, uh, I cannot be affiliated with Beelzebul because I'm fighting Beelzebul by my words, by my actions, by my miracles. But on top of it, in case you didn't get it, because you hear, but you don't listen, I am of the Holy Spirit. I do these works because of the Holy Spirit. And later on, there's this difficult verse which says, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And it's very dangerous to read this verse out of its context. That's why I choose to uh, elaborate a few words on this verse. In its context, the Pharisees are seeing the Holy Spirit in action. A man is healed. People were healed. Withered hand, blind, and all these things. After having seen God's spirit in action, they deny God, the Holy Spirit. And they attribute it to other principalities and authorities on earth. That cannot be forgiven. And you know why? Because the forgiving agent is the Holy Spirit. We need to pray to God to strengthen our faith uh, so we can be forgiven. If I am uh, boycotting the channel of communicating with God, and I'm saying it's Beelzebub, then I'm not trying. I'm not allowing God to work in me and to purge me and cleanse me. I block my receptive uh, inputs to the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus says, um, whoever speaks against, you can speak, you speak against Jesus, my sermons, and then you mature and realize, no, maybe I was wrong. Or not. But to deny the Spirit uh, and say it doesn't exist or uh, reject its uh, graces and actions in our lives, then you have no chance unless you somehow change your values and go back and say, I accept it. That's why uh, he ends up with verses 33 to 35, where it says, uh, from the tree you should know uh, the fruits. If I was preaching destruction, uh, immoralities, uh, abandoning our relationship with God, then you're right. My actions tells you who I am. But I'm preaching reconciliation, love, forgiveness, uh, helping the poor, visiting the sick. And these are all fruits of the Holy Spirit. How can you, seeing these fruits, deny the tree? That's why the concluding phrase is, by your words, you'll be justified and by your words, you'll be condemned. Be careful how you uh, proclaim your word and your thought, who, to which concept you adhere and you support by your words, by your money, by your priorities, making that stronger by your vote, by your sign, by your uh, support. And the thing continues, by the way, in chapter 12, Finally, verses 38, uh, the Pharisees were tired of him. Kept saying, it's Sabbath, it's Sabbath. Is it lawful? It's not lawful. And he keeps answering. Finally, they say, uh, <clears throat> give us a sign. Perform a miracle now. Then you will know your God. They wanted to follow a God that they are scared of and afraid of. They did not to follow God who's willing to embrace them with love uh, and uh, escort them to the shores 
of peace and eternity. Uh, a miracle, they're afraid, they're shocked, they have no choice but to bow down. And most probably once the impact of the miracle is gone, they forget. I mean, they saw the crossing of the Red Sea, they saw the miracle of the entry of the Promised Land, of Israel becoming a big kingdom, and still, they saw the miracles of Jesus, and still, so uh, Jesus uh, refutes this argument first, but then he says, uh, he calls them evil and adulterous generation. In other words, why do I have to perform a miracle for you who have ears but do not want to listen for centuries and you put your priorities and your uh, personal uh, pleasures and, and income over everything else, including God? Why do I have to prove that to you? It's your task to go out and bakash and seek the truth in your scriptures. I've revealed to you 600 pages of the prophets and the Torah. Uh, and if not, at least listen to what I'm saying and you'll see that it makes sense. But then, having said this, having told them that he knows exactly who they are, exposing their hypocrisy, he says, no sign will be given uh, to you except for the sign of Jonah. Now, what is Jonah, by the way? It's in verses, verse 14. Jonah is a prophet whom God sent to preach somewhere, but he refused to preach. So God uh, performed this miracle of his colleagues throwing them into the sea, and he was swallowed by the uh, uh, whale, and he stayed there for three days. Three days later, he came out uh, alive. It's a, it's a prophecy in the Old Testament, which comes from the kind of primordial times, and it's part of the Old Testament scriptures. So he says, the only miracle you will see henceforth is the miracle of Jonah. In other words, the miracle of man dying for three days and then coming back alive after the three days. In other words, wait, you'll see one more miracle, which is the miracle of my crucifixion, death, and then rising from the tomb. But even then, you will not believe me. That's why he says, the people of Nineveh, who, by the way, are the people where Jonah preached, ultimately went, on the day of judgment will be better than you who have seen all these things and have denied it. And then he goes further, he says, the queen of the south, Queen Sheba, who was pagan, not believe God, uh, who came all the way to Israel to hear the wisdom of Solomon and listen to Solomon. He says, Queen Sheba, or the queen of the south, will be better on the day of judgment than you of Pharisees and Sadducees. Having said this, and the final verses in this uh, chapter are interesting because Jesus uh, emphasizes the immediacy and the importance of this war against Satan. That's why he says, you cannot be lukewarm. You can't be here and there. Either you're with us or you're against us. You have to decide, make up your mind. And once you're with us, we need fighters. We need people who are strong and bold enough who can continue uh, uh, fighting this fight. And that's why here, right here, Matthew insists the story of as he was preaching, his mother, his sister, his brothers come, and the, the apostles and listeners said, uh, Lord, your family is here, so let's end it. He says, who is my family? My family are those who hear my words and abide by them. In other words, for me, my family is all those who listen to the gospel and actually live the gospel. So biological relationships are not necessary and important if that person is not a believer, if that person is not living the faith. Uh, what is important for me is, or for God, is those who listen uh, to the word I'm preaching and abide by it. This whole thing, uh, as you see the two chapters, whether it's the prophet uh, John the Baptist and then following comparisons, or whether it's the Pharisees and scribes asking about the law and the old law and he's saying the new is better than that, both serve as a buffer zone between the second and the third uh, discourse. The third discourse, lo and behold, the theme is parables. Now, why parables? Because in the book um, of Chronicles, 
we read a verse which says, when the Messiah comes, he'll be teaching in parables. Parables, <clears throat> in case you don't know, Thank you. I'm sorry. Are usually two layered stories, at least two layered. The immediate layer of the story has to do with our daily experience in this life. So about um, farmers planting seeds, um, carpenters, um, shepherds, things like that. But usually it has a deeper meaning when you understand the interaction of the story on that level, then you project that to the deeper theological level. In other words, replacing the farmer by God, uh, you know, and uh, the seeds by man and the being. You then grasp the meaning of that parable. Uh, many rabbis taught uh, in parables, not something unique to Jesus, but it was known that when the when the Messiah comes he will teach in parables. So the entire chapter, chapter 13, is a discourse uh, on the parables. If you read verse 1, uh, chapter 13, we have five minutes to end. Chapter 13, verse 1. The same day Jesus went out of the house uh, and sat beside the sea. Now it's not a mountain, it's a sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. You see this? This is verse 1 2. Now we go to the end of the chapter. Verse 50, one, 51. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been uh, trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. So the entire chapter 13, Jesus by the seaside or in a boat by the seaside, preaching about parables. And at the end, as we read, he leaves. Very quickly about these parables. Uh, let's go quickly through them. Uh, remember, again, the two meanings. The first one is that of a sower. So a sower plants seed. Some of the seed uh, fall on dry ground, uh, and they die within a few days. The others on, on the nice ground, but there's no depth to the ground. So they form some roots, but they die. Third one is nice ground with depth, but there's no water. So they grow, but then they die. Finally, a very nice ground, sun and water, and the tree grows. The point is, God only plants what is good. But it is this world and the conditions of world, this world in which we live that can change our uh, in, uh, directions to faith. So uh, people are born in families who are pagan. People are born uh, practically living their lives on the streets. Uh, others are born every Sunday in church, uh, and anything in between. So uh, you can't say, why did God create this evil man? God creates us all equal and equal um, in faith, but it is the conditions of this world that uh, change us. Very quickly, because we really have no time. I'm sorry, but uh, another parable about um, sower. In this case, the parable sows good seed. But then at night, the enemy comes and he plants weeds in between the uh, seed. And these weeds grow, and a few months later, it's almost suffocating uh, the tree. And the slaves come and tell them, Lord, where did this evil come from? And it's uh, interesting for me. Number one, uh, at my mother's garden here, there are a few trees uh, she loved. She had the uh, fig tree and all that. And it's amazing how, because we're away for a few weeks, this plant all of a sudden is surrounding the fig tree. It's really like suffocating it uh, because two, three weeks we were there. Um, <clears throat> so it's actually from the daily experience of, of the farmers. Um, and then 
equally important is the question of the people. If God is good and everything creates good, then where did evil come from? Well, because there's we have enemies, we have Satan who's trying to destroy us. Thus, we call it battle zone, a war zone between us who are with Christ and those who want to stay with Satan. So why? Why is because we were not vigilant enough and we allowed people to come, uh, evil people to uh, penetrate our life. Uh, but the good news is God is patient, ultimately will do justice. Other miracles, uh, uh, other parables, parable of the mustard seed, small, but if you nurture it, it becomes big tree. That of the yeast, small, but if you give it water and it becomes big uh, uh, yeast. The treasure hidden in fields, the merchants in search of fine pearl, and the fisherman who throws uh, the net. And whenever there's a good fish, they keep that. The bad one goes back to the water because it's not important. So on the day of judgment, uh, God will keep those of us who remain faithful to the gospel and those of us who were bad, who will throw us uh, back. As I said, the chapter ends with verse 53. Uh, when Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. I will stop here. This ends the third discourse about parables. We have two more discourses left, which hopefully we will uh, uh, wrap up next week when we meet our final session. Any questions? So, Pazan, how do we have a question in the chat from Dr. Paul Manu? Thank you, Sir Pazan Hyde, for uplifting and refreshing exposition of the Gospel of Matthew, remembering you in our prayers. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be with us. I know it's past midnight for you now, but Paul is from uh, Belfast, UK. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>